country, thank you for this state, and this community. We ask you, Father, your blessings upon our leaders at all levels. We ask you, Father, to be always with our first responders and those that take care of us in, in times of emergency. We thank you, Father, now for this club. We thank you for the opportunity to serve others and be able to simplify you. We ask you now, Father, to bless the food we have eaten today. We give you praise for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Terry Duffy is now coming forward for Fainway at Rotary. All right. Thank you, Brother Josh. Kind of short of the ranks on the birthdays and anniversaries, but nevertheless, big ones. Uh, sorry she's not here today. I understand Jenny's home sick with the bug. But Jenny Logan on July 24th, we might have to mention that again next week. Arnold Boss, uh, Boss on uh, July 30th. Anniversaries, Les Pinkard and Caroline on July 26th, and uh, Darren Roberts and Jacqueline on July 29th. Hope you all have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Catherine, Catherine Mayway can come forward to introduce our guests and visiting our series. Okay, we are happy to have you visiting Rotarians today. When I call your name, would you please stand and remain standing until all visitors are recognized? Whit Riker, guest of Rick Riker. Felix Hernandez, guest of Rick Riker. Jim Ellis, guest of Bo Thagger. Dr. Keith Bland, guest of Dennis Coe. Stephanie Crow, guest of Paul Lee. Tara Grant, guest of West Grant. Deidre Breslin, guest of the club. Hannah Watson, guest of the club. Bailey Wright, guest of Mike and Sheila Azar. Thomas Spiger with the Outlaw Club. Davis Flowers with the Outlaw Club. Lit Flowers with the Outlaw Club and Bill Harris with Wetonka. Are there any other visitors we might have missed? All right, thank you for visiting with the Dothan Brothers. Thank you, Terry. All right, I'm gonna ask uh, Brad Parrish, can you please come forward? <clears throat> That's right. Thank you much. All right, one thousand six hundred ninety five points. 
The last four are six two six four. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> to do this, please see Jenny or Heather. Uh, as, as you've heard in the past few weeks, Charles had a great impact on our club and uh, in District 6880. Uh, someone did inform me that Mr. Coggins was the one who purchased the four-way test banner down here uh, because no one seemed to be able to remember the four-way test. So, uh, so uh, we're thank Mr. Coggins for that. But, uh, see Jenny or see Heather if you'd like to make a gift. I announced last week uh, we have a date set for the white elephant sale. Uh, so if you weren't able to put that on your calendar or weren't here last week, uh, October 23rd, it'll be in this room. Again, we will have a tailgating theme. So uh, wear your favorite, uh, your favorite team's colors proudly. What day is it? I believe it's a Monday evening. Monday. Yeah, we'll have we'll have that in lieu of, of regular. Monday, also, uh, on your table today, uh, there are flyers that Mr. Walter put out. Uh, want to announce the uh, pay setter kickoff for the United Way. Uh, that's coming up here very soon, uh, next Tuesday, August 1st, 8.30, again, right here in this room. Uh, so I hope to see a good representation of those Rotarians at that event. All right, at this time, uh, if I could have Nick Oliver, please come forward. All right, Nick's a good friend of mine, um, and uh, he's going to be joining our Outlaw Club. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nick. Nick Oliver is an executive vice president at Amwin's Access, Access Insurance Services. He is originally from Columbiana, Alabama, and attended Troy University. Nick graduated with a degree in risk management and insurance in 2012. He worked in Atlanta and Birmingham before settling in Dothan. Was that two years ago? Yeah. Nick and his wife, Laura, have two boys, Davis and Barrett. In his spare time, Nick enjoys playing golf, spending time with family, and watching Braves baseball. The Rovers. All right, Nick, uh, you have been chosen to membership in the Dothan Rotary Club because your fellow members believe you to be a leader in your vocation and because you uh, possess the qualities that impart the message of Rotary to those with whom you come in contact. <laughs> You've been admitted not only to the Dothan Rotary Club, but to a worldwide association. And by virtue of your membership in this club, you will be welcomed into the fellowship of any Rotary Club in the world. The honor and privilege of Rotary membership carries with it duties and obligations. You will be expected to attend the club's meetings regularly, to perform your share of club service, and to place your knowledge and talents at the disposal of the club in its task of carrying the principles of Rotary in the daily life of the community. Nick, it is my pleasure to formally admit you to membership into Dothan Rotary Club. Fellow Rotarians, please rise and welcome our newest members. I did mention earlier that Jenny is unable to be here today, so uh, we'll get here. Your badge and pen to you uh, at a later date. Okay. All right, this time I'm going to ask Alex Reynolds to come forth and introduce our guest for today. Good morning. Good 
Good morning. Good morning. Hey, great to see everybody today. Great to be at Rotary. Um, certainly uh, grateful and thankful that we have our guest speaker today. Um, our guest speaker, Congressman Barry Moore. Um, as you all know, he, he probably doesn't need an introduction, but uh, he's born and raised in Coffee County, Alabama. He's a veteran, a small business owner, and he's a former member of the Alabama legislature. He went to Auburn University, graduated with an agriculture science degree from Auburn, War Eagle, to all the Auburn fans out there. Um, after that, he returned to Enterprise to start Hopper Moore uh, Incorporated, Barry Moore Industries, which is a waste haul, industrial waste hauling business. His wife, uh, he's married to his wife, Heather. He's got four kids, Jeremy, Kathleen, Claudia, and Jeb, and two grandkids, not saying anything about his age, grandkids, Liam and Alice. Um, in Congress, he's a member of the House Judiciary Committee and House Agriculture Committee. But if I can tell you anything about Congressman Moore, I'm most excited to tell you that just shortly into his second term as congressman, with over 3,200 cases solved for, for constituents across the second district, um, his genuine heart of service to the Lord first and to the all people of Alabama's second congressional district is why I'm proud to call him my boss and my friend. So, fellow Rotarians, please join me in welcoming Congressman Barry Moore. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, I guess. I'm on Eastern time, so I'm a little ahead of you guys a lot of times, but it's certainly an honor to be here today. And Alex, uh, thank you for that kind of introduction. I, I am truly honored to be here, and it's great to be in the district. I, I, I would rather be in Alabama than in Washington, D.C., I can tell you that. But part of doing the job of being in D.C. and in the fight, so certainly honored to do that. And, and what Alex mentioned is something I want to mention before I get started, is if you need help, if you have social security issues, VA issues, anything, passport, even if little Johnny's trying to make a trip the next couple weeks, and that happens a lot these days, Needs a passport renewed. Y'all call our office. We got one here in Dover, um, got him in Andalusia, Troy. We even do mobile office hours. So I did that intentionally when we were running. I said, you know, we got to be able to get to the district. The communities that are a little smaller that may not be big enough to support a district office. But so we do mobile office hours. So if you follow us on the Rep Area More Facebook, whatever the case may be, then you have an opportunity to say, hey, Uncle Joe or whoever, Aunt Jean, whoever, Barry's office is going to be in. New Brockton, Alabama on so and so day. They got office hours there at City Hall or wherever office. So they can meet us there. They don't have to get in a car and drive across four or five counties or two or three counties to meet with their congressman and the staff to get the help they need. And so that's kind of how our approach is. We're trying to go to the people and be I always say if we if we campaign among the people, we already govern the people. If we campaign from when I retire, we'll be governed from when I retire. So it's an honor to be a part of the process. Now, I can tell you guys. It's been an interesting seven months being in the majority. When I first went in, I, I can tell you, uh, third day on the job was January the 6th, and things just kind of went crazy from there. So we kind of went into a fight in the minority and, and had to just kind of hold the line where we could. There were days I really felt like asphalt. And Nancy Pelosi was old and they were over, and we were just kind of in the way. So now having the majority in seven months, it's been quite a fascinating experience. And I'll share a little bit of that with you. Paul mentioned, I mean, Alex mentioned that I'm, I'm on that committee and uh, only member of the Alabama delegation is on ag. We're the second largest peanut producing district in the nation, and it's right here in this part of the world. So we've got a farm bill coming this year. The big thing for the ag folks that we talked about, we had listening sessions around the district last year, was just reference prices, the input cost. If you're out there farming, I, I run the Yellow John Deers when I'm back sheriff before I started uh, in Congress. And so the Green John Deers, those guys have to make a lot of large investments to get that crop in the ground and get things done. And so Reference prices are going to be good. Uh, they're going to be, that's the fight we've got with the, with the, uh, the minority party on ag. And of course, input costs is part of that, but the insurance programs too to make sure that they're productive. So it's great to be on the ag committee. And uh, another thing too, I think is this district redistricting, that's been a fact that we really, when we scheduled this morning, we plan on talking about that. It wasn't really something that we thought would be an issue, but y'all been paying attention. A lot of times the wiregrass over the years, we've been the corner of the state. I mean, we, you know, it seems like we've kind of always gotten forgotten. So being a member and having a, a fight, having a, a dog in that fight, if you will, making sure that we have redistricting kind of go our way. And so um, we've had the House and Senate, they Paul will tell you they were in special session last week. And I think we've got a good chance. It's going to be a challenge, but we're in the fight, at least with this district. Now, the, the, the map will have to be approved on August 14th. And so it'll go before the three-judge panel, and then we'll see how that goes. But the district uh, is not going to be... Uh, 
just a slam dunk for Republicans, but at least I think we've got a fighting chance. So we'll get everybody on board from that time. And so glad to have that behind us. Hopefully the panel will go our way and we won't have a special master. I know that's one of the concerns for a lot of the House members that we didn't have a special master draw that map. Maybe they could draw it however they wanted and we could just add the wire map and have to fight for our future in representation in Congress. So um, y'all just kind of keep that in your prayers. I mean, we won't have to go to the little bit of the yeah, just we think you tell us that I think we can be competitive. So that's a big part of the issue. And certainly, Alex mentioned judiciary. Now, that's an unusual committee for a garbage guy from Alabama. I tell everybody that the transition from garbage to politics is pretty easy to make, you know. So you, you get in DC and there's just a lot going on, a lot of moving parts. And I'm sitting on the pool for August recess last year. Jim Jordan, he's a good friend of mine. He and his wife, Polly, they're dear friends of Heather and I. And Jim sits down next to him and goes, Hey, Barry, he said, uh, Would you consider getting on judiciary committee? And I'm like, Jim, you know I'm not an attorney, right? He said, well, Chuck Grass is a farmer. He says he does a pretty darn good job. He said, would you consider getting on judiciary? And I said, well, I don't know, Jim. Let me think about that. Because I was looking at some other committees that might impact different, different issues for our district, certainly. But this was a national issue. And so Bill Harris is my district director. Bill's based out of Wichita. Bill and I were sitting in a room. We were in our office one late one night or something. We were talking about what committees to ask for this time around. And he said, man, have you really, really... Was Jordan serious about judiciary? And I said, I think so, Bill. I said, let's just text him and ask him. And so I texted him, Jordan, and he said, uh, absolutely. He said, I will go to the map for you if you will agree to serve on judiciary. And I said, okay, well, in that case, we'll, we'll put our name in the hat for that committee because it's a lot of politics in committees as well, right? And so Jordan went for the map. Went to the map bars. Kevin McCarthy got involved for me to help me out. And so <laughs> wind up on the judiciary. And shortly after, shortly after we got selected, we were having a dinner in Washington, D.C. And then Gingrich comes in and goes, this will be the most consequential committee in Congress in the, two, the, in the 118 Congress. So I thought, what have I gotten myself into? And sure enough, I mean, we had the FBI director, Christopher Ray testify a few weeks ago. We've had the FBI whistleblowers come in. And I just bring a different perspective. I don't bring the attorney perspective. It's just a common sense kind of questions, you know, about border security, the FBI, the dossier, all that stuff that was going on that we heard about when Trump was president that now we're having to investigate. And the, just the 1023 that Chuck Grassy released, just I think he came out last week. You know, it's amazing what has been going on in our country. And the number one issue, when I talk to people in the district, when we did August recess last year, we did 14 town halls. The number one issue that people had was Filling the opportunity, the liberty to speak truth. Right? I mean, you say you can agree to disagree with me, but I ought to have a, a freedom of speech ought to be protected under the you know, Constitution. And so that was the number one issue that people had. So this weaponization of government against the American people has been quite astonishing. And the more we uncover, the more I'm concerned about it. And so we'll be moving forward. And one of the things Jim Jordan did last week, y'all will find this quite amazing. We offered a bill. We're trying to bring the FBI headquarters to Huntsville, Alabama. See, two, 20 of their 30 offices are already in Huntsville. And our thoughts are rather than spend billions of dollars and relocating or redoing the FBI office in Washington, DC, why don't we bring it back down to Alabama at least? And so we're not just that culture of Washington, DC, that swamp itself. Why don't we keep hiring people that live in that? They're not out here in real America. And so one of the things that Jordan did, we offered a minute, hopefully we'll have we'll get some traction on it. He said it yesterday on uh Rita Bartolomo on Fox News. He said, we're trying to bring the FBI headquarters on as well. And if we can do that, rather than spending, like I said, billions in, in Washington, D.C., we've already got 20 of the 30 offices. Why not bring the FBI and all these agencies that dwell in that small, that vote 90% liberal, progressive most of the time? Why are we hiring people within that system to fix the system that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more corrupt? And so we're starting to focus as majority leaders. How do we move those offices out of Washington, D.C., out to rural America, whether it's the USDA or whoever? to make sure that they're actually in touch with the American people. They are really your voice. Right? I mean, we're your voice, but they're your representatives, and they're out here supposed to help people. I love what Ronald Reagan said, you know, scary words are working for the government. We're here to help. But if they're in Washington, D.C., they don't understand where They don't understand Bass Crossroads or Headland, Alabama, whatever the case may be. And so those are some of the things we're starting to do as we have the first streams, too, the money. That's one of the things being in the majority is really helpful. And we've got some great leadership within the Alabama delegation on some of the key committees. And so... It's going to be interesting to see, but I think you'll be encouraged by what you're hearing and what we're trying to do. We're really, really trying to. I want to make the federal government so small it's not worth growth. You know, we say that around the office sometimes, but it's gotten so big in these cities, it's not always representative of you. And unfortunately, even 435 members of Congress, sometimes the bureaucrats don't listen to us. And so 
We're trying to give the voice back to the people and have a say in the process. And so I look forward to seeing what's going to happen in the country. And with us in the majority, like I said, it's going to be challenging times because now they're talking about Merrick Garland possibly impeaching him. You know, and, and he's the attorney general, but guess some of this stuff that happened on this 1023 thing with Burisma and the Ukraine, the very thing that they impeached Trump over is the very thing that they were doing. And so it's been fascinating as those documents are released, what was going on behind the scenes and how they were going after the president of the United States and accusing him of doing the very thing they were doing. And so if you just look at the, the money, you know, they say follow money, right? And so we got some challenging times, but Merrick Garland's going to be on hot seat in the next couple of weeks. Jim said that yesterday. And so, of course, Mayor is on Department of Homeland Security and the border. And we'll talk a little bit about the border, too. So I just want to tell you, uh, a lot of moving parts in Washington, D.C., some challenging times for those of you who believe in prayer. Put me about number one or number two on the list. You know, just behind you, kill kids and your wife. We need the prayers, so we need wisdom to charge forward and kind of do what needs to be done for the country. And it's not, it's not an easy lift. But I'm sure when Moses was being told, hey, all these, these children of Israel, they were all spying them on, right? He's just going on doing a job. Some days you just got to go do the job. And so y'all keep seeing your prayers, one of you with them as we move forward. And so let me talk briefly about the border. The, uh, I've been to the border three times, and uh, one of the interesting things that you guys, it, the number of people that are pouring across the southern border is quite remarkable, 200,000 a month, right? And so we had Sheriff Daniels. He came in and testified in front of the committee, and, and I asked him, I said, Sheriff, tell me your perspective on the, the border right now. He said, 2018, he's four decades on the border. He said, 2018 was the most secure I've ever seen the border. He said, it's the biggest mess we've ever seen now in the 40-year history. And what happens is our con the border agents have become concierge. They're not really there to protect the border anymore. They're just processing people in. They're just in process. And so we have thousands of people pouring across that southern border down there, and they're getting government subsidies, 800 a month. This is UM Arizona testimony I'm talking about. UM Arizona, 800 a month, and they're getting a cell phone, a phone that you, you pay for, taxpayers pay for, so we can track them and so we can call them when it's time for the court date. The problem is they're not taking our calls. They take our they take our phones. They just don't take our calls here. They just disappear into society. And so that those people born. And here's another thing. And I, I mentioned this meeting as the one of the things that's most troubling to me is the cartel are making the money. I mean, we said we got control of border. The cartel are the people making the money because if you're coming just south of the border, these are priced a few months ago. So it was if you were coming just south of the border, you could pay the cartel five four to five thousand dollars. They would get you through the U.S. southern border. That's just south of the border. If you were coming from the Triangle Nations, but the south down Honduras, Nicaragua, it was eight thousand. If you were coming from Russia, it was nineteen thousand dollars. If you're a Syrian, it was twenty thousand. If you're a Chinese national, it's eighty thousand dollars. And so they pay the cartel to get them through the border, and they can't cross because the, the cartel actually controls the southern border. But say you didn't have the money. Say we were coming here, and we didn't have the money. You can cut a deal with the cartel and say, well, I'll backpack heroin, cocaine, or fentanyl across that border for my passage. And that's why, Sheriff, sure, you see the drugs just pouring into the country now because we have groups of people that are just backpacking fentanyl into this country. And so, and it's not staying in those border towns. It's coming to communities here. You know, so we've had over a quarter million overdose killed young people since Biden's been in Ohio, fentanyl poison. And it's so legal. It's so hard to control. And so, We've got that challenge with the southern border. We'll have Mayorkas. We actually have him, and I'll have him in Judiciary Wednesday. He's the Department of Homeland Security Secretary. We're going to question him and go over this. Mayorkas is interesting, though. He really can look straight at you and lie to you in your face. That's the weirdest thing. I mean, most Chris Perez, FBI, is pretty sharp guy. When you ask him a tough question, he catches the party. He knows kind of how to work around it. Mayorkas will just look you straight in the face, tell you how to border secure. And you said you're showing videos of people pouring across the southern border. And so, Challenging time for us. And even now, south of the border, you can find just thousands of IDs. You're like, Barry, why, why would there be thousands of IDs? Because they throw their IDs down before they get to the border and then they identify as minors, unaccompanied minors. And so we process them in a port list, put them on a bus, ship them somewhere in America. And the, the 14 year old girl that was raped in, a, in the uh, a, uh, restaurant in Prattville a few months ago, y'all probably read about it, an illegal. He identified as a minor. He was 28, I believe. And he already had a criminal record in Nicaragua. But he threw, his, he threw his ID down south of the border, came in, we processed him, he shipped him to Alabama, or via somewhere he came to Alabama. And so 
Those are the things that we're addressing right now. We have our playbook, but the administration is turning a blind eye and they're breaking the law. But right, so more is going to be a continued fight for us. But uh, I'm just glad we're the majority we can ask for some questions. So now we get called, we end up on fresh things up, but we can actually grill them. So you probably want to stay tuned. I think probably Wednesday, I think so we have Mayor Cassandra. That would be an interesting time. There's been some some pretty intense questioning and some some back and forth between us and the, the members of, across the aisle as well as the witness. But uh, we're starting to hold them folks accountable and we'll start it. I think you're going to see some impeachments. I've been kind of pushing for some of that. But it's a huge distraction for Congress because then we have to focus. Impeachment takes all the energy out of the room on policy because you're now dealing with criminal elements. You're dealing with research and investigations to try and figure out how you move forward and get somebody removed from office. So that's going to be pretty challenging. Um, whistleblowers. We had the FBI whistleblowers in a few weeks ago, and I think you will find this interesting too. Is we had two graphs in judiciary, and it shows the Clinton campaigns over here, and they were actually paying for the information for the dossier through the DNC. And this is just directly, I mean, it's just, I'm not trying to be partisan, I'm just going to tell you what we saw, and then y'all make up what you will. So the Clinton camps over here, they got DNC, and they were funding Christopher Steele, they were feeding him information up through the system to go into the dossier. On the other side, you had Danchenko, and then a former Democrat operative that was also working to fund it. So you had funding from one side and, and information from the other side, and it went into the dossier. So when the FBI realized, actually, Clapper, CIA director, went into the Oval Office in the White House, and he said, down with Barack Obama, Joseph Biden, Loretta Lynch, and James Comey at the time, who was the director of the FBI, and he said, he said, uh, just so you guys know that Clinton and the DNC are working on this dossier Russian narrative, and y'all just need to be aware that that's what they're doing. So everybody within the administration knew that that was trumped up from the other side of the aisle. When the FBI, Comey didn't even tell the people down the chain of command, they actually stormed out of something in the, the hearings when we started saying, did you know that Comey knew? He never told his agents who are good people in the field that were trying to do their job that, hey, by the way, this is coming from the Clinton camp. Never told them anything. And so you got this FBI, all these resources, trying to investigate this dossier. And then when the FBI down, down the chain of command figured out that it was false information, they offered Christopher Steele $1 million if he could verify anything in the dossier. How many here think he collected the money? Not a dime. But that's all we heard was Russian collusion, Russian collusion, Russian collusion. And Comey knew the whole time. He knew the whole time, folks, that there was nothing to the story, but he never told the agents. So they were doing investigations, dragging the Trump camp, general plan, everybody. So they got the FISA awards to file on the Trump campaign to attract general plan and all the rest, knowing that there was nothing to the story. That's the kind of corruption we're doing. And it's like, the weaponization of government is a dangerous thing to live. And so we have got to start going through that process. But here's something else. We, you know, then when we got them on that, and we said, hey, by the way, we know now that what you did with the FISA course, you didn't verify any information. Y'all, the FBI turned that warrant around and filed General Flynn in less than 48 hours and did it on a Sunday night. They didn't verify one single thing in the dossier. And they started a full out investigation on the Trump campaign. And so when we figured that out and we called the FBI in, this is before I got there, but when we called them in, it was like, we cleaned up our act. There's no more of this FISA abuse. That's something we're about to have to do. We're fixing to have to limit their ability to use FISA more to spy on American citizens. Because now the way it works is if Bill Harris, my district director, takes a call from a foreign country, and they want to say it's suspicious activity, then everything else Bill Harris has ever done is now open again. And so that's what they began to do. They would use these wings, though. He talked to so-and-so and Let's, let's face it, if you're in a campaign, you're campaigning, you're probably going to talk to some people from overseas from time to time, especially if you're trying to do a transition part or a transition. Tell them, what are you moving into the office? Transition teams, what you know. And so, this 702, these ability to just spy, to go within and just listen to American citizens' phone calls and see everything that you're doing, we're fixing that for one that. But the FBI sure to say clean their act up. And then we saw just a few months ago where they paid $3 million to Twitter. To suppress the hard body my cops. And they knew, they, they knew, now we know that the information on it, they knew even then it was a, it was a legitimate concern and it had some valid validity to it. It was his laptop. But so I told, I asked Christopher Ray, why would you pay a million dollars 
or offer a million dollars to Christopher Steele to verify a dossier against one campaign and then pay $3 million to Twitter to quieten the laptop story in another campaign. We don't need law enforcement and the FBI playing in elections in our nation. We don't need them picking our presidential candidates. We don't need them elected. We don't need them putting their thumb on the scale at all. Decent prosecutors most of the time would say, hey, this might impact the election. And certainly if they didn't verify what was in the dossier, that, that they shouldn't be out there pushing stuff, pushing stuff. So a lot of interesting things. And that was just one of the things, and like I said, between what's going on with the FBI, we've got our, and that's another reason we're not looking to find them and send, send a big new headquarters in Washington, D.C. We're like, enough of that, enough of that. Let's move it to Hustle Alabama. Let's move it out of there. Move it out here where we got some everyday American people involved in the process. And hopefully, um, if we can begin to kind of clean up that mess that didn't get like that overnight, it's not going to fix itself overnight either as well. So one of the things, and, and so uh, also Coach Tucker, well, y'all been tracking Coach. <laughs> Hard to say. Yeah. 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 Alabama fans. Are you an Alabama fan? I also bring back the moment. Oh, well, where are you <laughs> But uh, yeah, so Coach Starr was kind of standing in line. Y'all been watching, and he's been standing in line on Lloyd Austin. And Lloyd Austin's an Auburn grad. So here we go. We got a coach and a, and a former Auburn grad. And Austin, Secretary of Defense now, is he's trying to run around when we pack, you know, when they, in the Supreme Court a few weeks ago when they turned over Roe v. Wade. Lloyd also decided to fund abortions by allowing soldiers to travel and get abortions. And so Coach warned me, he said, hey, this is, this is, this is against the law. Number one, federal funded taxpayers uh, or federally funded abortions with taxpayer money is against the law. And so Austin was trying to go around. And, and Coach went over to the Pentagon months ago and told him, hey, stop this, what you're doing. This is against the law, number one. 60% of American people are against it, and we're just not going to allow it to happen. Lloyd just charged ahead. And so coaches had been standing on the Senate floor and object to these, uh, these, these uh, promotions until they get their act together. And the Senate can go ahead and do these, the promotions. They got a little longer process. But they are determined to taxpayer fund abortion. And so coach is holding the line. I've been standing with him. I mean, it's been tough on him. But it's just one of those things. It's the principle in the matter. 6% of American people are against it. It's against the law. Why are we going to allow it? They need to focus on something besides both policies in the military. They really need to focus on being ready to defend and fight and, and, and do what this country needs and from a defense perspective rather than going low. And it's got, so we're having to kind of start working there. We passed the NDA a few weeks ago out of the house. Up to that point, Coach was standing by himself. And the NDA is the National Defense Appropriations Act. So just so you know, we just passed it out two or three weeks ago. The House majority, we were able to put some amendments on there. Some of us in the House too talked that we're not going to tax fund abortions. We're not going to pay for transgender subsidies. That's just two things the taxpayers not understand. We don't mind buying you nice tanks, nice jets. I mean, we believe in investing in defense and we're going to get the strongest on the planet. But there's certain things we shouldn't be funded with taxpayer money. So that's one of the things that we got through in the NDA a few weeks ago. So that'll be interesting. But I, I think we'll see what the Senate does with that. But at least we sent something up there that they, they've got some ground to stand on and defend. And Coach is now not standing by himself. I think that was important. He had 217 House members. Actually, had four Democrats vote with us on that. So it's kind of neat to get. get enough support to get it out of the house. And, and so it's been a, an interesting time. And so that's one of the things too I want to mention. And of course, Israel, I was in Israel a few weeks ago. Iron Dome's working great. Um, they're an ally of ours in that region. You know, and so certainly we've got to continue to fight and defend Israel. We've got some great technologies over there. And they're working on some more amazing things. But everything about Israel's guys, their, their weapons are all defense. I mean, even the reactive armor on their tanks is defense against attacks. And so they're not out there starting this stuff. You know, Hamas and Hezbollah is constantly launching missiles in there. And so Iron Dome's working well. I found this interesting too. Y'all find this in the room where we were meeting, where they were testing this stuff. And it was like really, really top secret stuff. There were clocks on the wall, like this big round class, clocks, clocks like we used to have in classrooms. You know what I'm talking about? And they were from like, you'd have London, London, and maybe Paris. And then Huntsville, Alabama was up there. I thought that's fascinating. And they were watching DC, London, Paris, and Huntsville. Or something like that. I was like, there's about four or five major cities in Huntsville, Alabama. So we're really tied in with the defense industry in that part of the world. And so we're excited, of course, for Fort Rucker down here. And that's one thing, too, with this redistricting. I remember, Paul, I don't know if you remember, but 2010, I was on campaign's constitutional election when I got the state legislature. Stephen Boyd called me, Martha Rosie's chief of staff, said, Man, you got to help us. They have cut Maxwell Gunner out of the second congressional district and just left Fort Rucker. 
If Martha wants to stay on ask, we need both those military bases in that district. I actually got a ticket for running a red light on my wife's car trying to get back to my government and fix it. But we fixed it because we knew how important that was. And so this redistricting is huge, not only here, but so goes Alabama, so goes America. Because Judy Letlow over in Louisiana, they're watching us so close, which she knows this better than we know it. Because her seat will be one of those if we walk away from this redistricting and don't fight. Really, there's probably eight Republican seats nationally. No, we got four seats in Georgia right now. And that's when you have Hawking Jeffries running the thing instead of Kevin McCarthy. And so a lot involved in this redistricting, a lot we have to do and engage in. And so it takes all hands on deck from right here in Houston County, all the way to the second congressional district to make sure that we're not the forgotten corner in, in, in the country and certainly in the state. So um, with that, I'm going to open up for a few questions. I don't know, but I've got a little... She's here, and, I, and, and if any of you guys want to ask questions, I'm happy to make notes, and I'll try to get to them. Um, anybody got a question? If not, I got some things I can talk about. What's Shifty Shift? Adam Shift. So he's going to run for the Senate in California. Imagine that, Paulie. He's on judiciary with us, and uh, he is now throwing his hat in the rain for the Senate seat out there. And and uh, he really part of this narrative because he had he had supposedly top secret briefings. He was telling us he guaranteed that Russian collusion was factual. But here's another thing too. Now, if you look what Jim Banks said over the weekend, he's a Republican leader from Indiana. He said we probably need to go back and, and, and rescind the impeachment of Trump over Russian collusion. Now that we know that the FBI knew the whole time that it's right. And so we'll see what shift. There's a bunch of those guys, Nadler, which I do not like Nadler as much. But at least I think he believes what he's doing. Um, Chip, man, he just wins a change. Whatever works for his narrative, and, and it's so offensive sometimes what they say. We just have to buy our tongue in there. And look, I got some friends across the aisle. My best friend when I was in the state legislature was a female Democrat. But in DC, we didn't have this communication. Now, McCarthy's doing a better job. He's doing a better job with that because Nancy was not, it was like, man, we didn't talk to the Democrats. Plus, he didn't allow us to have communications with them. Everybody had masks and it was rough. It's gotten better under McCarthy's leadership. So we'll see what Schiff does. But somebody says he's actually, I'm going to send the seat to Diane Bonson and he's dying, getting on old and she's going to retire. He'll be running probably for that seat. Paul. So much time we got. So I got about two minutes. I can tell you all about the speakers, but if you want to hear about that, just one of those non, non things that I mentioned, it was 150 year history, right? I mean, it's just, that's how crazy it's been. But we broke 150 year history on the speakers vote. And I hadn't mentioned that because it's been so strange what's been going on in D.C. But the speaker voted. Now, Kevin McCarthy asked me to fly around with him like a few weeks before the election. Say, hey, Barry, I need to go here and there. So me and him wrote, we go around campaigning with these candidates. Well, I told Kevin on the fly, I said, Kevin, it's a little different than what it's always been. There's not going to be a rubber stamp for the speaker. So what do you mean by that? I said, well, 70% of the Republican conference is new since Trump was elected in 2016. So you've had a tremendous turnover in our party, Republicans, when I say our party since Trump was elected. So there's a lot of different people there. I mean, you get all kinds of right? because, But we all kind of feel like it's, you know, we can kind of speak what we believe in. And so you, we're not like cats. You know? I mean, we are like cats. You can't hurt us. We're not sheep. You're like, we're going to do what we think's right. And whether you like it or not, Kevin, that's just the way it is. And so I think that's been good for the country, though, really. If you watch, like, Kevin just can't get a rubber stamp. We just don't continue to spend into oblivion. When we're already at 100% of the GDP. We have the next four or two. We just can't continue to spend like that and print money because, guys, the U.S. currency, we've got to make sure that it's the currency around the globe, right? We don't want those guys to start trading commodities around the globe and push the U.S. out. So we need the U.S. dollar to kind of be dominant in the market. So if we print it, it just creates problems for us. Not for you just consumers, right? Not for us just trying to buy gas and groceries. And whatever else you're trying to buy, but it starts to impact us on the geopolitical scale around the world where we're printing money and it starts to affect the US dollar. And so there is, I tell Kevin, I said, this is not going to be a rubber stamp like you're used to. And so a little different than than uh, than the normal speaker vote. On the 14th vote, y'all, this is crazy. On the 14th vote, Kevin, he'd already called me on one of the 12 votes to stay with me. He said, we've got to be worked out. I can't thank you. Well, is he going to be able to work out or not? No, we got to get this thing done or we're going to lose control. I mean, the Dems are going to elect our speaker. We'll never have these here until we talk about that. And so, um, on the 14th vote, I actually took my Bible before because that's when you get sworn in, right? And so, I'm thinking, we got this on the 14th vote and it was late, late at night. And so, I was like, 14th vote goes and we don't get there. We thought we had a deal there. And so, 
the stress was quite intense. If y'all were watching TV, which a lot of people were, I don't know who watches TV at 2.30 in the morning, but there were apparently a lot of people watching TV. And so y'all saw one of the members of the Alabama delegation come on the floor and go after Matt Gates. or remember who you watching. I was sitting on that road. And so I had Matt Gates, Lauren Bober, Ralph Norman from North Carolina, and then me. And so when that member went after Gates, some of the other friends are, you know, we were even in disagreement on this. I voted differently with them. I voted with Kevin every time. But some of the other friends of mine came and kind of stood around Gates. Laura and they were going to make sure they didn't get assaulted on the floor, you know. And so it would get really intense. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, we just made the motion to adjourn. We have failed the American people. We are not going to get a speaker. Republicans had already made a motion to adjourn after the 14th vote. We had failed the American people. And so you could feel just the pressure in the room. You could feel the intensity of it. And so the friends of mine that came and stood on my aisle in front of me, blocking Bobert and Gage from any other assaults, were facing me so they couldn't see what was going on behind them. Ball had a friend of mine with a beard from Louisiana, Clay Higgins. He came up on the road in front of me and he came over there and he sat down. And Andy Biggs was one of those that was under interference to try to keep our members from getting, you know, kind of out of hand and getting assaulted. So my friend Clay Higgins just grabbed old Andy Biggs. He was on, he was on leaning back. He wasn't even looking, he didn't know what's going on. Man. He had no idea. He was just looking. Oh, Higgins grabbed old Andy and started praying. I'm looking at Higgins' face, right? He's, I'm on the road. I'm sitting here facing Biggs is facing away. He's facing Biggs is facing me. Higgins is facing me. But Biggs don't see Higgins. Higgins began to pray over that man. And I, I could just see the tears flowing down Higgins' face because the stress was immense, guy. Yeah. And uh, he laid his Bible on Biggs' hand, just kept praying. And finally, Andy Biggs, from, I can't tell you, I know why, but I can't explain it. He looked up and he said, Let's do this. Let's go on a journey. And Biggs was one that was leading the not McCarthy votes. And guys, I'll tell you, on the 15th vote, just like that, we ran down, changed our vote not to adjourn. And uh, we passed and, and, and voted Kevin McCarthy's bigger than 118 times. So sometimes, no matter how great we think we may be, how smart we are, and how good a deal McCarthy's got cut, sometimes it's beyond our control. And I think that Higgins pointed that out to me. And I told Higgins later, I said, What were you doing? He said, Man, he said, I just felt compelled to come pray. And so I encourage you to pray for our nation. I encourage you to pray for us. We don't have all the answers. I mean, I'm a garbage man from Baptist College. I'm going to fight for the future of this country, as all these members are. We need wisdom. I mean, that don't come from us. That comes from prayer. I believe that 100%. I don't, I, it's just the Lord allowed me to see that, and I was ready. But uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot of good people there. I've got a lot of dear friends. There are a lot of good people in the fight. You may not see them on CNN. You won't see them on CNN. Um, you might not see them on Fox. But they're good people and they're in the fight. And they love this country. No, we don't agree all the time, but they love this country. And I do too. Thank you for having me, and God bless you guys. Thank you, Congressman Moore, for all you do and for being with us today. Next week, uh, we will have Pam Miles here. Uh, we, we, most of us know her uh, through the Exchange Center, but she recently started a new consulting group called Change My Mind. Uh, so come out and uh, listen to what Pam has to say. I uh, want to thank all the guests and visiting Rotarians that were here today. Great crowd. Thank you all for being with us. Hope to see you again soon. And thank you to, to all the Rotarians that helped uh, make today's program possible. Uh, if you will, please stand and uh, we'll recite the four way test. Of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it be a good will and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Have a great week. <laughs>